I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear My mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I got nightmares in my head, I fear Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Where is he? We are on day 8 of the search for 19-year-old Jay Slater. And it seems like searchers, law enforcement, the people watching from the sidelines are no closer to finding Jay. Where is he? In this analysis, we're going to look at statistics and the great outdoors and what I want to do, this is something I actually wrote as part of a script in my very first analysis. I never got round to sharing it, but I think it's important to address our misconceptions and the way we do tend to overestimate ourselves in the great outdoors. And we're going to look at that and statistics. Not a very sexy subject, but nevertheless, I think important if we want to find Jay. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do welcome to the many of you who have subscribed. If you find this analysis worthwhile, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So statistics and the great outdoors sounds like a very dry, dull subject, doesn't it? In modern times, we think we have tremendous preeminence over nature because we have a cell phone in our hands or air conditioning at home or because we, we have a steering wheel in front of us. But take that all away. Take the car away. Take the cell phone away. Take, turn the air conditioning or the, the power off. And then we're pretty ordinary. Put a person in nature without a cell phone, without food and water, or just water, and we're far less adapted than critters we consider lesser to ourselves, the birds, reptiles, and insects. Is it possible for a person to die after spending just a few hours alone in nature? Absolutely. It's just happened to Michael Mosley. Now, I previously gave the example of comparing Table Mountain National Park in Cape Town, South Africa, to Mount Everest. You wouldn't think of Table Mountain as a deathly or a dangerous theater, and yet it is. Almost as many people die on Table Mountain, often more than on Mount Everest, the highest mountain on our planet. And there was a time where more people died on Table Mountain than Mount Everest, some years, right? So while that's statistically true, it's not always true. With some years, Everest pulls ahead, while in others, Table Mountain has more fatalities. But you've got to ask, how on earth does someone die on Table Mountain, which is a mountain that rises right next to a city? You know, what's, what, what, what could go wrong? In 2018, the figures stood at 251 deaths on Table Mountain, that's total deaths, and 288 on Everest. On average, there are 10 to 20 deaths per year on Table Mountain, which is marginally higher than the average on Everest, although the death rate on Everest is a thousand times higher. Until 2017, over 26 million had visited Table Mountain compared to less than 24,000 climbing Everest. And you might say, what do these statistics have to do with Jay Slater in Tenerife? Well, actually a lot. How do those people who come to grief on Table Mountain right beside a city, what happens? Well, the point is you don't need especially treacherous conditions or to be in the death zone, like to be above um, 8,000 meters for people to find themselves tricked or trapped into testing situations outdoors. And more often than we expect, things don't end happily ever after. Let me say that again. Outdoors, more often than we expect, more often than we anticipate, things don't end happily ever after. And by the way, I'm not sure what the rate of kidnappings are on Everest or Table Mountain, but it's likely a tiny fraction of the fatality rate in both theaters. And that's what people are arguing here, that 
what's more likely is that he was kidnapped or some some kind of un, um, unclear foul play scenario, which is possible. But isn't it more probable statistically that there was a situation? Think about it. Someone walking into the wilderness, not just a flat wilderness, a mountainous wilderness, a rugged wilderness, and a wilderness that was actually fairly cold. You might say 15 or 16 degrees Celsius isn't cold for me. I'm from England. It's not cold. Well, when you factor in the wind chill and protracted exposure and that he'd spent the whole night partying and that he was thirsty to begin with, well, then that changes things. The humidity I checked was above 80%. Now, that's going to accelerate dehydration as well. And so I suspect the same statistical reality will be borne out here. And that's just talking about probability. I'm not saying it's absolute. I'm simply saying that's what seems likely. And that is the sort of intertextuality that we get from Table Mountain, South Africa. And I do think it's relevant that you can have what appears to be a fairly benign situation, a landscape. And of course, the longer time you spend in that landscape and you haven't had enough water means that you may struggle at a certain point to locomote yourself if you're dehydrated. And then what happens when you, the, uh, the dehydration reaches a extreme level? I mean, have you thought about that? There are so many people that are focused on this person as a violent thug. That's kind of what a lot of people are thinking about and focusing on. What about thinking about what we know and dealing with that aspect? And so what are the symptoms of severe dehydration? Well, obviously being extremely thirsty, having a dry mouth, but it will then, gradu- it will then graduate, escalate to you will start to breathe faster. Then your heart will breathe faster as well. Then your blood pressure drops. That can lead to a fever. And then that the next step is feeling irritable, feeling drowsy, and becoming increasingly confused. And in that state, you're susceptible to tripping, stumbling, and worse, falling. And so I don't think Jay was just walking and he fell down a ravine. I think he was becoming increasingly compromised by dehydration. Once it became severe, he was probably almost in a panic trying to get himself out of the situation. And that in that state of confusion, he could have, first of all, made a decision that was not very wise, you know, going off the road or, or making towards a particular point. But, but in the state of confusion, he, he would almost be like a drunk person and this could lead to him uh, not seeing properly and falling over this rough terrain. And that's perhaps how he got himself into a serious problem, compounding the problem he was already in. Does that make sense? And so I think that addresses this question, where is he? The question is, how long was he able to walk in this confused state from the position of that final ping? Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. 